Good afternoon. Welcome. I'd like to get started so that we don't, we don't miss a thing. <laughs> uh, but first, I want to say a few words about this series, um, the Celebration of Faculty Careers. It's actually a series that evolved from uh, two previous uh, actions uh, of the strategic plan, which is called Faculty of 2020. And it included a professional development at all stages of your career and an alignment of criteria and processes for hiring and promotion and tenure with as the scope of the college evolved as well as its leadership values. So and in reviewing some of these things, a desire was expressed for a post-promotion uh, or post-tenure review type of process, especially at the rank of full professor, that would offer an opportunity for reflections on the accomplishments of individual faculty members over the course of their career, and also provide an opportunity to look forward to the next phase of actually what direction that you were going to go. So full professors, at least seven years beyond their promotion, uh, are part of this series. And they present colloquia on their achievements and their plans to their peers as well as to the graduate students. And actually, this is followed by a planning discussion with the dean, if they so choose, uh, and, and the head. So Bill has that to look forward you mean to. if the dean chooses, right? <laughs> <laughs> if she wants to talk to me. Right? And she does. <laughs> So this series started in, 20, in spring of 2013, exactly three years ago, and it was fully implemented the following year. So uh, given that sort of background and what this is all about, I'd like to say a few words about Bill. Bill earned a BS in aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan, and then an MS and PhD degrees in aerospace engineering at Arizona State. He joined the faculty here in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics in 1995, and why he's been with us, he has actually interacted with industry in many roles, including a lot of uh, consulting arrangements, summer visits, and research collaborations. So Professor Crossley has been recognized for his teaching efforts many times, and he was inducted into Purdue's Book of Great Teachers in 2013. So with that very brief background, I guess you'll tell us the rest. So please welcome Professor Bill Crossley. Thanks, Kathy. I appreciate everyone coming out today. I, I got to be honest, I'm really nervous about this, so I can't exactly figure out why. I think when I saw Steve Heaster give his, I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And I'm going to have a hard time talking about me <laughs> as well as Steve did about him. Thanks for coming. I think, Kathy, just uh, you took the first half of my, your introduction was the first half of my slides. Uh, but I am glad to hear that it's seven years past promotion, so I'm actually young. I had a colleague who's not here, so he'll re remain nameless, said, I can't believe you're doing this. This is only for the old people. So I found out I'm the youngest of the old people, so that's good. But we recruited. <laughs> yes, and so I <laughs> um, thought I'd start out, uh, maybe I've been too clever. So how did I get here? That's a talking head song this is a line from. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I was born. My dad was a chemical engineer for Procter & Gamble, so there's a little overlap with Professor Howe. We're for the same company, probably at the same time, different parts of the world, though. My dad worked for P&G. He was, still is probably the smartest guy I know. He was a chemical engineer. But he also had to travel quite a bit. So we were always taking him to the airport, and I was always fascinated by these big things he'd get in and, and disappear. My mom taught school. She taught a lot of business classes, but my mom was a school teacher. So I somehow managed to put those two things together. I'm teaching engineering. So I thought that was kind of a neat thing. Uh, I had a pretty early interest in aerospace. So I managed to dig out a few old family photos. There's me at Cape Canaveral or Kennedy Space Center. It might have still been Cape Canaveral at that point in time. And I must be about four trying to climb into the mercury capsule there. And then here, this has got to be the uh, Yorktown in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, because that was the first carrier museum that opened. And I think that's an F-11, uh, the Tiger, the Grumman Tiger. But I was playing around. And I just had some photos of me playing around with airplanes and things. So that was pretty neat. And I liked airplanes, and I liked rockets and spacecraft. And so I decided for my career report in sixth grade, I needed to write a report on aerospace engineering. So that was cool. And the school helped set up a bunch of different discussions. And so I got to talk to an engineer who worked at General Electric. If you grew up in Cincinnati and you're an engineer, you work for Procter & Gamble or you work for General Electric, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I talked to the guy across the street because he worked for General <laughs> But the school helped me set up an interview uh, with the department head at the University of Cincinnati, which was pretty neat. So I don't know if I can do the math. I didn't write the year down, so trust me on this one. But it was the mid-70s, late 70s when I was in sixth grade and did this report. So I mentioned I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is the southern part of Ohio. My dad actually grew up a little bit north of us. He grew up in a really small town 
uh, kind of north of Dayton, Ohio. So I do this interview with the department head at the University of Cincinnati, and he you know, answers my questions. He's very nice. It's all good. My dad and I leave, start walking down the hall to leave the building. Walk past an open door. My father's name is Guy, and I hear a voice from inside this office say, Guy Cross, is that you? And my dad stops and goes, oh, hi, Neil. <laughs> so my dad grew up in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Um, he's two years younger than, was two years younger than Neil. So I got to meet Neil and spent, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half with him because my dad knew him. And Neil was at the University of Cincinnati, loved teaching, it was clear from that. And so, you know, 90 minutes, but wow, what an impact that had on me. And so some of that little stuck in my head and probably said, you know, maybe this teaching gig isn't so bad if the first guy on the moon wants to do it. <laughs> Wasn't sure about that though. Okay, so time passed, I grew up, did all those stupid things kids do when you're growing up. One of the stupid things I decided to do was go to school at the University of Michigan <laughs> because my dad was an Ohio State Buckeye. <laughs> so to this day, there's a few weeks out of the year we don't talk to each other. I bought a lot of beer over the last couple of years for him. I'm hoping that'll come back. When I was a student there, the current coach was the quarterback, so that's, that was, looks good for me. So some of my colleagues who've been to the University of Michigan know the fabulous FXB building. It's a beautiful building. Well, that wasn't there. That's the building I was in. And Steve was there too. That's the building we were in. I got there in 1986 and, and started my studies there. And one of the things that happened, some of you know Tony Wass. Tony was probably 24, 25, and it was the first class he ever taught, and I was in it. And so some of you know Tony, and Tony was teaching structures at the time, and it's a unique small class. I think four of us have ended up being faculty members of different universities. Uh, Deborah Factor Lepore is like, I don't know, some senior super vice president of all aerospace. We had a crazy class, that class. And Tony remembers all of us. I got interested in structures. And then you can see on the title here, who would want to go to Arizona in the summer? Well, I did. <laughs> I got a job internship, an internship offer at McDonnell Douglas Helicopter, and so that's just a picture of the Apache flying over some swaros, and swaros are like that by the plant. It turned out I liked Arizona in the summer. 127 is pretty hot. You know, the dry heat thing goes to about 110, and then it's just hot. But I liked it. It was kind of neat. And while I was there, I found out about a program that they had with Arizona State University, where basically you would go to graduate school at Arizona State, but you'd also work at the same time. It's kind of a neat setup. I wasn't sure about that. I was pretty sure I was just going to be done after four years and go off and get a job and, and do that kind of thing. Came back to campus, Pete Washabaugh, some of you know Pete as well. Pete had just started teaching that semester, and Tony said, oh, my colleague Pete is just here. He probably needs somebody to help with some projects. And I started doing a directed study project with Pete and started talking about, I liked Arizona, and this is what happened. I wasn't sure about graduate school. And he said, you know, Bill, you're one of the smartest kids in the class. I didn't think I was. You should be going to graduate school. You should be going here. And I was like, well, I don't want to. And long discussion, Pete convinced me that, you know, going to Arizona and, and working for McDonald Douglas and going to Arizona State would probably be an okay thing. So that was great. I was really happy about that, and, and Pete really helped me out there. And so I graduated in 1990. And the only reason I have a picture of me with that thing on there, we made the Detroit Free Press. Uh, my, the best man at my wedding, it wasn't, we were, that hadn't happened by this point, but my buddy Kurt Flasky and I made these little paper airplanes and stuck them on our mortarboards and walked to graduation. Detroit Free Press had some coverage and said, and the aerospace engineers walked with space shuttles in their heads. And so, wow, well, it's not a space shuttle. It's supposed to be like a paper version of the Saab Griffin, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> we made the newspaper. <laughs> So I moved to Phoenix, and it's called the Valley of the Sun for a good reason. It's hot, but I enjoyed that. I liked it. So there's me. So this is Steve Bass, and then me. And if I do this, you might notice I found the tie, actually. <laughs> so this tie is old enough to drive. Uh, <laughs> Jack Rutherford was my boss and one of my great mentors. I uh, was an adjunct faculty member at Arizona State, so he's also on my committee, but uh, Jack was probably one of the guiding forces in my early career here. Tom Thompson, you might recognize, those of us who had to go through ABET, Tommy was our visitor. Um, last time we had a visit, and Steve Larson. So this was a chunk of the Advanced Concept Development Group at, at McDonnell Douglas. Uh, it had to be in the right place at the right time. I had this structures background, wanted to go to work at McDonnell Douglas. I was going to school at Arizona State, and so I liked structures, and so Dave Landon was my advisor. He grew up in Boston, but he liked Midland and Arizona too, so that's why he's got the Red Sox hat on. And I had an office at Arizona State. I worked on my master's degree, doing st structural optimization of composite structures. And what that was doing to feed my job at McDonnell was we were working on this crazy concept here called the CRW. Eventually became the X50, but this is the CRW. And figuring out how big that airplane is and si you know, what's the size, weight, and performance of this thing, there's no historical precedent for that. So how do you go about doing this? 
And the challenge is what do you do about the blades? How do you size those blades correctly to get the weight right? And so that was what my master's thesis was. How do you set up and solve this kind of problem? What's the right techniques to do that? That fed into me going back to my job, writing the sizing codes to do the sizing and trade studies for this kind of airplane. I think Steve took this picture when he was running the wind tunnel test out at, uh, at NASA Ames for us. And I think I've joked with John before is that that experience, me being back in Mesa and them having so much trouble was when I took this job, I said, I'm not getting anywhere experiments because stuff breaks and you have to wait forever. <laughs> and I don't want to mess with that. So this is an aside, but then John and I agreed to do a project and then the tunnel broke, right? And so coming up, I don't know if Sally is here yet. Coming up, I told Sally I was going to stay away from the wind tunnel or other project. I didn't want to get near it. <laughs> Yeah, we, <laughs> Terry and I were bad luck in the wind tunnel. <laughs> so, you know, since I was a graduate student at Arizona State and I was working with Donald Douglas Helicopter, I thought, you know what, it might be kind of cool to have a bunch of students work on a design project. So we put together this design proposal. That's just pictures from the, the report. We entered the American Helicopter Society competition that Georgia Tech wins every year. They get first and second place every year. Well, this is the year Arizona State got second place. Should have beat them. That's when, I, that's when my dislike for Georgia Tech started. <laughs> but I did that and, and did a pretty good job, I think. And my boss was an adjunct faculty member at Arizona State and said, geez, Bill, you did such a good job with that. Do you think you could help me teach the aircraft design class? Because he had to do that in the spring as part of his adjunct faculty job. I said, sure, Jack, I'll help. And next thing you know, he's traveling all the time and I'm teaching the class. <laughs> but actually, that class turned out to be pretty rewarding. I enjoyed doing that. So here's little pieces, right, starting to filter in. Like, I'm convinced I'm going to get a job, and now here I am going to graduate school while I got a job. And now here I've got a job teaching, and I'm liking that. So while I'm doing that, let me de deviate a little bit. I, this is what we did at McDonnell Douglas, right? We had a set of requirements. Some ginormous document came from the government about requests for proposal or requests for information. We did a study. And the job we did was in the blue box there. Everything else downstream was not completely somebody else's job, but was more detailed and had more information. And what we would do here, get this to work. There we go. Notice there were two things we did. We'd get in a room with a bunch of us and all the gray beards and all the smart folks and say, what do you think our vehicle should look like? Okay, so we'd come up with ideas and we have these different selections. We'd make these discrete selections. And then once we had a selection, We'd size it, and this is the part I was doing, and this is great, right? Everything's nice, and you could, you could figure out how big the rotor needed to be, what was the disc loading, what's the solidity you needed, what kind of power to weight ratio did you need. All right, that part's good, and I can optimize that pretty easily. But this first part always bothered me. You know, because somebody like, um, Bob Head's a smart guy. Bob Head said, do this, so okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and that bothered me because, hey, wait a minute, this is just brainstorming, which isn't a great way to come up with ideas. It's not bad, but it's not great. And it's influenced by your experience and your personal preferences. This is a little sketch I had for my dissertation to illustrate that, right? So one guy's saying something else, another guy's thinking about something else. That's how a lot of this gets done. And then once we go to this quantitative stuff, I mean, we use computer programs, we can do the optimization and trade-offs. And so how come I can't put these together? It started bugging me. So again, another slide. I think this is easier for my dissertation or from a, they're from a dinner talk I gave at the AHS right after I gave my dissertation. But, so Rotorcraft has these discrete selections and these configuration choices, but that's really what we would call a mixed discrete nonlinear programming problem. So I've been taking classes at, at Arizona State, so I was getting smart about saying things like that. Oh, that's MDNLP, and all my colleagues are like, what are you talking about? But I had these discrete variables and these continuous variables, and you can't put those in an optimization problem. And I'd taken some design theory classes at Arizona State, and one of the things that was under study at the time is how humans did a single concept. You come up with an idea, and you work on that idea until it either doesn't work or you forced it to work. And that's really not very efficient. And that was a big field of study at the time that NSF was funding. And I saw both those things. And I was at an SDM conference, so Structures, Dynamics, Materials conference, because I had a structures background. And I'm pretty sure it was one of Rafi Hafka's students, and probably his or her first one, because my first presentation was probably lousy too. Presentation wasn't very good, but they mentioned genetic algorithms, and I kind of went off and, like, Homer Simpson goes off to the land of chocolate. <laughs> I went off to the land of, wait a minute, what this guy just said about how genetic algorithms do this search, that should be able to take these discrete decisions that I'm making, along with this continuous sizing that I can do, I should be able to put this in the same problem. This algorithm should be able to do that. And we hadn't seen anything else that could do that. So there's my little, <laughs> okay. So there might be a dissertation here somewhere. So I did this. And I don't want to go through all the details, but the, the point here is this is one slide out of my dissertation. I also learned how to get 
PowerPoint 95 slides into PowerPoint 2010. So if you need to know that, let me know. <laughs> it's like, I kept going, it won't open, it won't open. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do tomorrow? Because I was doing this last night, right? <laughs> uh, not completely. but So the design team had this meeting left replacement helicopter study, and my colleagues did this study, and I said, I'm not going to be in that study. Well, you guys go do this, and they were allowed to publish it because it was a Navy study, and it wasn't really going to lead to anything. They were kind of trying to challenge the Bell guys to get the V-22 working, and this was just, okay. So they wrote a paper, and we picked these three concepts, and then I said, well, let me turn the same problem on the genetic algorithm. So the three concepts that the design team picked with our normal brainstorming and selection, pretty good designs. And then I used my code, there's a bunch of caveats here, right? I used my code to predict how much that airplane would weigh. And then I turned the genetic algorithm loose on the same problem, but I included these discrete selection choices in here, along with some other stuff. I mean, it was a bigger problem than I'm kind of making it seem here. But we did this. The concept I came up with was a tandem rotor plus a wing to allow a maneuver. We counted for the downloading and all that kind of stuff for those of you helicopter guys in the room. We had that. I think we did that well. Look how much lighter these airplanes are. And it's just the GA doesn't get the exact same answer every time. That's why there's four that look almost the same. So that's pretty cool. We did something that where I sorted through more designs in the computer. I let the computer do the dirty work. And then when you got done, why is this design better? And then the engineers did the engineering work. And most of my colleagues go, you know, we probably missed something here. So it was neat. I can't prove that this is a better design, but it, it gave me this idea that something's in here. And I kind of left my dissertation and working on this. And these were some neat things that I thought, because I was really interested in what we were doing at McDonald's, where we were combining these things. And I started reading other people saying that the genetic algorithm had these features that were design-like or creative-like. And I thought, I'm on to something here. This is kind of neat. So that turned into my dissertation. And I think it was well received. Did OK. Got a few papers out of it, like you're supposed to. And then I started my 20-year career at McDonnell Douglas. Except if you're doing the math, that's not going to work, right? OK, so something happened here. <laughs> so I'd signed my life away, knowingly, to McDonnell Douglas for paying for my graduate school. And in early 1995, I was asked to reapply for my job. We had this thing called TQMS. Was, was, everybody was reorganized on time. The joke in McDonnell Douglas was time to quit and move to Seattle. <laughs> OK, so I'm, I'm oversimplifying some of the things, but I'm, here I am, early 95, getting close to finishing my dissertation, planning to stay at McDonald's because things are going well. I'm enjoying the advanced concepts group. Well, suddenly the advanced concepts group doesn't exist anymore, and I have to reapply for my job again. I've had to do that before, but it never was a problem. So the job I got offered was to take 2D drawings of the Apache helicopter on vellum and put them into your graphics. I was like, oh, geez, I could have gone on the street to ITT Tech for like three weeks, and I could do that. And uh, oh, by the way, I kind of missed, missed an important point back when I had that office at Arizona State. It was in my notes, I just forgot. So one of my office mates at Arizona State kind of asked me if I could play on a softball team with them. I'm like, I'm not that great of an athlete. Turns out I was one of the better on the team. He's a team engineer, so you get the idea, right? So he's played basketball with me, he knows, right? But the second baseman was really cute. So I started dating her. And I'm married to her now, right? But so my second baseman is working here at Honeywell, and now suddenly in Phoenix, and I'm finishing up, and what's going to happen? I went to the library yesterday and took a picture of my camera, my phone, which I couldn't have done until recently. I found this in Aerospace America. So I started reading this. OK, blah, 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 blah. Wait a minute. There's a faculty position that says interest in design in, in the job announcement in 1995. Now, it's really for a structures person. I thought, well, wait a minute. I just went through all these things. I did a structures master's degree. I know something about structures. I'm really interested in design. So I wrote a letter to Professor Sullivan and said, hey, I'm really interested in design. I could probably teach structures classes if you wanted, oversimplifying a little bit, but that's kind of what happened. So I had an interview. That's, that's a frightening process. All of us went through it, right? We're all remembering that. I don't remember much of what happened. I remember talking with people all the time, and they were always asking. But the one question I almost always got asked was, what classes do you think you're interested in teaching? I gave a few, but I think my answer always started with this class. I don't know if this got me the job or not. I don't know. But this is a cornerstone class to start the curriculum. So you who are undergrads and things know what this class is, right? And when I got here, and I got gave me the job, right? So I, I'm now what I'm supposed to do. So I can tell the class had been passed around quite a bit. I was strongly suggested to get other faculty to help me with the class, which was great. It got me a chance to meet Kathy. So I was less scared of her. I'm still scared of her, but less scared of her. <laughs> First time I met her, school, gosh. <laughs> Stanford PhD and uh, orbit mechanics and quaternions and blah. Ah! So, <laughs> 
But Kathy helped me out, Steve helped me out, I had James Doyle help me out with the structure. It was great, and it was a good way to get, get kicked into this, but there's a lot of room for me to do stuff different. And so I realized pretty quickly that, uh, for whatever reason, students knew less about airplanes and spacecraft than I thought they should and I thought I did, and they were really poor at giving presentations. So I invented something I called Vehicle of the Week. Now this is from my example, because I didn't want to pull one of the students once. And I can work in a picture of the Constellation. It's my favorite airplane ever. Still trying to get a ride on one, too expensive. They have a few flying, but. So I said, well, why don't, why don't small teams give this presentation? You get up and tell us about an airplane or a spacecraft, so you're telling us how big they are, how far they fly, how much they weigh, how much payload can they get to orbit? And you give a presentation, and I'll tell you what you should do better with the presentation. You write a little report, and I'll mark it up so that when you turn in your final report at the end of the semester for the project, you're not surprised that I'm mad that you, every sentence was in passive voice, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. And then I learned quickly that I knew more about airplanes than I did about spacecraft, still do. So, but, so I was giving the students the final project was an airplane, but half the class was about space. But the minute you turn in your final report and go to the next semester, you ask, oh, how did you like 251? Oh, it was great, it was all about airplanes. What? Because, well, the project was about airplanes. So about, okay, so I had to do something to switch that. And so here's some pictures. We started doing air-launched uh, orbital things, so, you know, replacement for Pegasus. On station satellite servicing, we designed the airplane and the rocket. Mars airplane a couple times, right? Get an airplane to fly on Mars. So that was kind of fun, that was neat, and here's a couple of pictures of that. I, I enjoy doing that. I, I, I still tell people that this is probably my favorite class to teach. Now, I haven't taught it in 10 years, so I, I could find out wrong if I have to go back. <laughs> but I really, I really got a kick out of this class. This was great. Then one of the things that uh, was in my offer letter said, you know, also teach graduate things in your area of, of, of interest. And so, MDO would be, multidisciplinary design optimization, would be the area of, of research that I would consider myself to be in. So I started this in spring 97. Uh, SS Rao, many of you might remember SS, he was over in mechanical engineering, had a different engineering design class, optimization class. So I really geared it more toward all about MDO, assuming the students would have taken SS Rao's class first. He left to go to the University of Miami in, in Florida, I think because he didn't like the cold winters, I don't know, but he's still down there. That went away, so I evolved it into something else, right? And so I started doing things, and here's just some slides that I use in class to give you an idea, something to look at while I talk about it. But I started putting in more basics of optimization and pointing toward MDO. So I've, I think I've said for 10 or 15 years now, there's going to be a 650 at some point to do MDO too. I had no idea what was going to happen with this class. Wow, this, I made this little chart here inspired by some of the charts that Skip was showing about enrollment. I thought, I got that data from my class. I can show that. So, I got clever, it's all gold and black, right? It's supposed to be anyway. So spring 97, I had 15 students in the class. That was cool. I was happy to have 15 students in a graduate class. And then you can see in fall 00, there's a little old gold there because somebody at GM saw our course catalog and thought, oh, I think it'd be nice for students to take that class. Can you get Professor Cross to do it at a distance? I don't know what that means. Sure, I'll do it, why not? And I started giving classes at a distance. And you can see what's happened. So I've had enrollment as big as 153 students in this class. So it's a pretty big class. So 550 became the first Aero and Astro class on TV. This is a recent photo. I can't, I don't think I have a v, VHS player. I got VHS tapes from an old version down in one of the things in my office. But so there's me giving a class. And it's been kind of fun given the delivery. And I've really enjoyed Reaching out to people, I, I mean, I've had people all across the world in the classes. It's kind of fun. And not just aerospace engineers. I talk from an aerospace background, but mechanical engineers and sometimes electrical engineers, industrial engineers have all taken the class ABE. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, I, I was doing this, and this is the first year I've got records for, and then last year. So Tassos Lorenzis was the graduate chair at the time, was really pushing us to do this, and so he and I worked hard to get this, more of our classes on here. So in 2002, 2003, there were 26 students in AAE classes. So probably 15 of mine and probably the other in Skip's class. I think we were the first two on distance students, distance students. And there were two students actively pursuing a degree. So last year, we had 289 course enrollments and 100 students, 112 enrolled, 100 active last semester. That's a big deal. And we got 31 aero classes available to distance students now. So I think that's a pretty neat thing. I, I think this helps the faculty in the school. It helps our reach provides resources back to the department. So I'm really pleased to have been a, big, a part of this, helped do that. So while I was getting this optimization stuff going, I, you know, the title was Aircraft and Optimization and Systems and Design. So I got involved with this morphing aircraft. So there's a long background here. I did some work at NASA Langley, 
and did some work with LNR and Boeing, and then consulted for Next Gen Aeronautics. And then eventually we had another big program with, uh, with NASA to look at how do you actually figure out how big this airplane needs to be. So real quick, a morphing aircraft is one that can make significant changes in flight. And these were two that got, these look like drawings, they are drawings, but actually versions of them actually flew for the DARPA program. The Terry Weissar actually left Purdue to go run. He didn't start it, but he was active in the area as well. And when the program manager left DARPA, they brought Terry in to run the program. So here's just two pictures of that that they did. These are, these are huge changes in flight. These aren't little things that we could do with, you know, they're, they're big changes. So I started getting curious, well, how big would this need to be? And how much morphing is the best amount of morphing? And, and I'm an optimization guy, so is this an optimization problem? Can I minimize the airplane's gross weight, meet all these requirements? And can I somehow stick in the morphing as one of the variables? So my colleague at Boeing, Ed White, started calling it morphing as an independent variable, because cost as an independent variable was really popular at the time. So, Started doing that, and we tried to look at how to do this, and can we identify what's the desired amount of morphing and how much? So the problem blows up, and this is just meant to say, well, for every mission now, I've got a different wing shape. And I've got to tie that back to somehow a structure that makes sense, and we did other work on that. So there's a whole body of work behind this, but this is now a big problem. I can't make a carpet plot for this. I've got to do something that's an optimization problem. Oops, sorry, I went a little too fast. So through, with several students, we worked on this for a few, uh, while. I don't want to bog everybody down with the details. But what ended up being fun for me on this project was not that we need a new optimization algorithm. It's how do we set up this problem so we can get the answer we want? So how do I minimize the airplane's weight? That's usually a good metric for if it's a good airplane or not. Meet all the performance constraints and handle all these morphing variables. Well, OK, figure out what the airplane looks like, then go off and do the analysis. Tell me how much it weighs. Well, this part looks good. This looks like an easy optimization problem. The part that got a little more complicated here was oh, I got to actually figure out how to do the simulation where the airplane's different each time. And if the airplane's different each time, how do I figure out how different it is each time? That should be driven by, and if I go one more slide here, each of those boxes, mission leg one, mission leg two, mission leg, those should all be optimization problems. And so now I've got this big nested optimization where each of those mission legs looks like this. Now I know I went through this too fast and there's too many equations to follow all the details, but nobody had done this before. You know, Lockheed and Boeing and NextGen and people were thinking about this and a lot of it was ad hoc. How do we do this? This is how you did it. And one of the keys was this objective function where we minimized the fuel on each segment and then added a penalty term because it was possible to set up the airplane that it couldn't meet the mission requirements in the leg because it was changing its shape so much. And this little trick let us get through the problem. And I guess I'm kind of oversimplifying Mike Skillen's thesis, but that, that really helped us get this to work. And I remember, I'm gonna, I guess I'm allowed to brag because my celebration, but I remember being in a meeting, it was really fun because uh, Chris Martin from, he was the CETA for the DARPA project said, this is some of the best sizing work we've seen. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and so I had a lot of help. Uh, you know, Josh Fromer and Mike Skillen and Brian Roth all worked on this. And this is just a picture. We did this really crude on purpose because we didn't want to infer that we were giving you a fully defined airplane. We were showing how you would do this. And look how the wing changes from a takeoff and a long cruise long, long loiter and a fast dash, the wing gets small and swept, and you have to go back home, and how do you do that? And so this worked, and it was the first end-to-end -end sizing problem that I think anybody had done in morphing aircraft. Okay, I'm going back and forth, and, and I hope that's okay, because I couldn't put it together chronologically exactly. I kind of put it together like how things started and where they fell into things. So that's optimization. There's a lot of math equations there that I kind of waved my hands at. But I also knew from McDonnell Douglas that not everything had math equations. And nowhere in our curriculum do we talk about these design methods. So I started a class in 97 called Design Methods for Aerospace Systems. And these are just pictures from some of the projects we did in the class. How do you do this stuff that isn't really crisp and quantitative? How do you give a design team guidance to go through and do these qualitative decisions? And how do you teach the students that these aren't bulletproof panaceas that fix everything? There's pros and cons in these. I, I don't want, you know, so QFD, there's uh, weighted objectives up here. I got a Pew's matrix showing there. We do some design experiments for quick and dirty design improvement. I still show the 21st century jet video in the class. The so students look at how they did the 777. Try to give that context. And what I think has been neat about this, I haven't taught it recently, that's bad, but what I think is neat about this is that students took this class put it on their transcript, and then went to get a job as a systems engineer. And a lot of them came back to me and said, this class let me get this entry level job as a systems engineer. 
And Purdue doesn't have a systems engineering degree, do we? Okay, so that's the systems part, right? Aircraft systems was in my title. All right, so in 2003, Terry went to DARPA. He stopped being the 451 design instructor. I started teaching it. In 2009, I caught on to this NASA Aeronautics Challenge. So is Nithin in the room? Yeah, there you are. That looks familiar, right? You're probably embarrassed about it by now. But in 2009, Nithin was an undergrad. He hasn't been here the whole time. He left. He's come back. Don't, don't panic. <laughs> I'm not that tough on students, right? <laughs> But they got second place, first time we ever entered this thing. And actually, the best thing is they got second place because in, on January 25th of 2009, my youngest daughter was born about eight weeks early. So I don't remember a whole lot. <laughs> and somehow these guys still managed to get <laughs> second place in the competition. We didn't enter in 2010. 2011, we got two places. 2012, we took second place. 2013, we did such a good job, the NASA judges told me we're not awarding anything but first place to Purdue. It was awesome. I mean, and the students did the work. It's just great to help them be part of it. 2014, we got second place. Last year, we didn't place. So I don't know if I goofed up or what, but last year, we didn't place. Hopefully, this year, we'll be back in the mix. That's been a lot of fun. So I've enjoyed doing 451. I've tried to add to that as well. I tried to bring my experience and my continuing exposure to the industry to, to put in with this. And so what I've tried to do when I teach 451 is we have three reviews a year with some industry review panelists. And so I've called on different colleagues to do this. We've kind of evolved into a program where Boeing, commercial airplanes, Lockheed Martin Advanced Development Programs, and Northrop Grumman kind of share. We've got good ties with those. But I've had Raytheon and Beechcraft, depending on who's owning the company at the time, and Cessna, now they're the same company. Students get up. Well, not get up. We do a WebEx. But we do a WebEx, and they will give their presentation. And the industry people will, will, will be mean to them, right? There's a few in the class, right? Now, they're nicely mean. They could be meaner if they wanted to be, right? If Brandon's not in yet, they could be. But I can't tell the students this is what it's like in industry, and they can't quite get that. And so if the, these guys can tell you, hey, look at this, do this, this is what's important, that's a huge impact. I think it adds a lot of relevance to what you guys are doing. Some of you are here nodding. I haven't done the grades yet, so you're, of course you're nodding, right? <laughs> I haven't turned your grades yet. Oh, yeah, that's the best thing we ever did for us across the <laughs> But I think that's a neat spin, and it's been nice that I've got contacts at these places to be able to do that. One of the cool ones is I've got the skunk up there. I think Mike Bosiaga took my class in 2004, and he did this. And he was one of the students getting railed by the Lockheed Martin guys. Mike is at Lockheed Martin now, setting up their view panels, railing you guys, right? <laughs> Giving you guys a hard time. So that's kind of a neat circle there we've got. All right, 2002, um, a lot of you know John McMasters. And I got to know John pretty well. I'm not sure why that picture popped up right away, but that, it's, John encouraged me to apply for this program. Now, Boeing started this well over program as best I can tell, to get traditional faculty members who'd never like, worked in industry a chance to see what Boeing did. I said, well, John, that's not me. I, I already work for you guys. He said, no, no, you should apply. OK, so I did. And so I, obviously, I screwed up my PowerPoint animation, but that's the Bellevue's one. I spent the first part in St. Louis working in smart structure. And that's the Building 100. We're actually next door, but there's no picture of Building 103. <laughs> there's a picture of Building 100 in St. Louis. I spent some time also, that's 106. That's the hangar next door. Um, I also spent some time talking with people doing systems engineering and systems analysis. Because systems engineering, everybody said, oh, we need aerospace engineers who are systems engineers. But nobody would tell me what a systems engineer was with any clarity. And then I went to Bellevue. That was supposed to pop up now to talk with the math group and the optimization folks. One of the lasting impacts that happened here, though, is Mike McCoy, who was at Boeing as an operations analyst, had led Boeing's team, at least the technical part, to bid on the Deepwater program. Boeing lost. Now, it turns out there is no Deepwater. I have a couple of Coast Guard people. You're going to go, oh, no, not Deepwater. <laughs> a bunch of things confounded to make it not work. But the guys at Boeing said, we were having these huge problems in figuring out how to do these trade studies and what was the new vehicle supposed to look like and how many. And the more I listened, I thought, there's something in here that's an academic, right? Like I popped up before, hey, there must be a dissertation in here somewhere. There must be something in here. So Mike got me started there. And, and the thing that really sealed it was I was talking with Pat Cassidy, who does aircraft configuration. And we were just chatting about stuff. And midway through the conversation, and probably nobody knows Pat, so it may not be as funny. But Pat stops and slams the table and goes, God damn it, you're Bill Crossley. And I was like, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> he goes, no, you're. Turns out they were using the sizing code I had written at McDonald Douglas in the 90s to do the work there, here in 2000. And I'm like, well, what are you using it for? And they were doing the same thing. So if, if Coast Guard wants this huge integrated capabilities. They don't really care what the vehicle is. But the people that were doing the vehicles were doing the same thing that I was doing 10 years before. OK, 
Something needs to happen. That was what happened out of the Bell and Wellover program. So I'm really glad that John McMaster's got me to go to that. So then this is a slide that I was, so next thing you know, get off the plane from Seattle and Tom Ferris, the head of time says, did you learn anything in Seattle? Well, you learned some stuff. Do you think that any of these would fit the signature area? Oh, maybe. <laughs> so I wrote up two pages. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Young, just, just promoted associate professor writes this two-page document. Next thing I'm going to all these meetings and with people that I'm, wow, I'm, really, I'm at this meeting? We were one of the eight that got approved. It's down there at the bottom. So we got to be a signature area. And next thing you know, I, I need a lot of help. And so guys like Tom are helping me quite a bit. Joe Peckney helped me quite a bit. Dave Swain was a chief technology officer at Boeing. He got wind of this. He had heard that it came out of the Welliver program. He was a big fan of this. That was a huge help for us. I heard a story. Oh, it's being recorded. I probably shouldn't tell this. <laughs> I will anyway because I started it. I was told that after we talked with Dave Swain about this, he was, came to a football game and met President Jiski and mentioned this as one of the more exciting things he'd heard from Purdue in a while. So that was kind of cool. That I kind of started that snowball. So then I started using this to describe it everywhere. I'm not going to go through all of it. I pulled stuff out from the slides that I was using. I had to pitch this to my colleagues. Why are you doing this? And some people go, I don't get it. But I showed other people and they go, wait a minute. This sounds familiar. Wait, we're doing this with supply chain. We're doing this in transportation. We got those same problems that started catching on. And so this emerging context was you know, all these different systems that have to work together. They op operate independently. There's human interactions. And somehow people heard what we were doing. And I was asked, not invited, invited is special. Asked means please submit your paper. Invited means come and we'll make you, we'll make you like the king of the conference. I gave this talk at MIT in 2004 about what we were doing and some of the ideas that I personally had. Alex Levis was in the audience. Alex was the chief scientist for the Air Force at the time. He said, come visit me at the Pentagon. That is way cool. <laughs> then the secretary has to come get you past the gate. And you go through all these, and I know why now, right? Because it's security. You have to go up this stair, and you come out this doorway, and you walk down this hallway, and you go down another stairway. And I, OK. <laughs> but got to talk to Alex in his office about this. And he, was a big, he said, you're doing the right thing. Keep doing this. We were able to hire a couple people. Dan was the first, so Dan and Cerny and I got to get on an airplane and fly out to DC to brief the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, which is a lot of fun. That's one that I don't remember very well because this was probably April 2005. So March 19th, 2005, we added Jack and Anna to our family. So I hadn't probably slept since I found out we were having twins. <laughs> this was a trip away from home, nobody was crying. Well, I was probably crying on the trip. I, I don't remember, was I crying on the trip, Dan? <laughs> But Serena and Dan and I went and gave this pitch. And it's kind of neat. And, and one of the things that's great about it is, is we met Natalie Crawford, who's ran Project Air Force for RAND. And Natalie's a big supporter of the school here, too. But I think Natalie was impressed by our technical content, but she always asked how the kids are doing, too. It's kind of neat that they get that kind of connection with somebody like that. So we did that. We've hired six people through the signature area. And we've got six new courses from these faculty. And I think we've done pretty well. I mean, I know the signature areas have evolved, but I think we've done pretty well. OK, so in 2009, you've, most of you have seen this document. So in here, a System of Systems Institute showed up. Now, 2009 was when I got promoted to full professor. So I wasn't really in the mix in what happened to make this document happen. So I wasn't in there advocating for it. There were enough people. I know a couple people in the room were really helping. But there must have been something that Dean Jamison and everybody else saw value in this context. And the concept, and let's, let's get it go forward. I, I know that wasn't and probably still isn't a university held view. But there were enough people that said, this is important. It should be part of what we do at Purdue. So Dan and I were involved in some of the first action planning. We put some things together. And then we hired two tenure track professors, one specifically in systems in IE. We hired Dan Dumbacher, who's here, and Bob Kenley as professors of practice. And then in the front here is Charlie Bolden. A lot of you recognize Charlie. Next to him is Deb Adetta. And the provost said, we, we want to do this. Let's make this happen. And so we were officially got to be called Purdue Systems Collaboratory. Collaboratory is a made up word. It's on purpose. I'll tell you why if you really want to know, but not right now. <laughs> Dan and I are in the back, right? So they align us by height. So I, I'm, I, I basketball height, I'm 6'3", which means I'm 6'2 and an eighth, right? <laughs> and Dan is a little bit taller than I am. So we're up in the back, but we're back there uh, with that. This was a neat thing because, you know, depending on how you measure it, it feels like a long time since 2002 in my visit to Boeing, but, you know, it's still going. We got something going. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the background, the curriculum development, course designators, all kinds of planning going on. So that's, it's been a success, and I'm proud to be part of that, too. So this happened along the way. Dan Roos from MIT, I think Dan's a National Academy member. He was one of the people who helped start ESD, the Engineering Systems Division at MIT. 
he, wanted, he thought, you know, there's some groups doing these things, but the INCOSI isn't the right group for academic endeavor, and they're not looking at system of systems or engineering systems, whatever you want to call it. <coughs> so Dan asked me to join the executive committee. I, I was a little nervous traveling a lot with twins at the house when they were little, and he kept coming back, and I joined in 2007 as the executive committee. A funny story that I probably don't have time to tell, but because I've been, I'll give the short version, because I've been interacting a lot with colleagues in Japan in 2014, I became very acutely aware that you don't just quite say no to people, right? It just, that's just not how Jap Takashi helped me very much. Takashi-san helped me very much with this time. It was very good to have somebody from Japan helping with this. But I become very much in the mode of telling people, no, that'll be very difficult, or I'm flattered. So they asked me to be chair, and I said, oh, that'd be very difficult, but I'm flattered, and sent, hit send. And so then later, Dan Roos says, oh, so are you ready to start as chair? And I went, oops, <laughs> what? I thought I'd said no, but I hadn't. I hadn't actually said N-O. So I'm getting better at that. That's a lesson learned. So CSUN has been going for a while. I, I'm actually helping, it be, it's a long story, but I'm kind of running it now. That's the point. That's been a lot of fun. And it's, I think it's some visibility for Purdue in this. And then just last week, I was in Delft and got a sign, at least symbolically, because I'm not allowed, I'm not high enough rank. That's okay, I'm not, that's not a complaint. I just happen to be able to be there. Pauline Herder is next to me signing on, on behalf of TU Delft. So we've got a nice relationship now with TU Delft and the Systems Collaboratory, in part because of CSUN. So that's been fun and a good hook. Uh, why am I interested in this? What am I doing? Maybe I'll skip through this a little bit quickly, but I got interested because, it's like the deep water program, if you've got all these airplanes and these things doing something, how do you know it's the best new airplane to add? Isn't there something formal? Can you do some formalism to this? And I'll show you that's how I got interested. It turns out to be a mixed integer nonlinear programming problem. You're assigning airplanes, but the new airplane's got these continuous variables, and some of the coefficients in the, in the integer programming problem are functions of these other variables. Uh, you can't do this. Not exactly. Here, I pulled out a couple. I, I hate putting too much math in a presentation like this that's for everybody, but <coughs> I've got, tried to indicate down here that bottom blue line. There's a coefficient that's a function of other stuff. And that makes this ugly. And so how do you go about solving? Whoops, sorry, how do you go about solving this? So using my MDO background as a motivator, we, we tried to figure out how to get one subspace to do one part, another subspace to do another part. And then it, we tried all kinds of stuff. Turns out the best answer is the easy one. Sometimes it's hard to find that out, right? Navin's smiling because Navin was involved at this early on too. But Mahara Mane and my and I got this going. This almost matches the original MINLP problem, and you can solve it. So that's great. And this was the first work of its kind. We've noticed people copying it in other areas. We did a problem using Northwest Airlines. That was good because they just merged with Delta, so nobody would get in trouble. We weren't telling an airline how to run its business. But we were motivated by a real problem. You couldn't solve this at MINLP. That's the red line. And we can show if you got the right aircraft, you could cut down your fleet's operating costs quite a bit. So the methodology seemed to work. I've been told that Lockheed Martin used this approach for a contract on a military cargo thing, but I don't know what exactly they did because they can't tell me that part, but that's been cool. I know the folks at Boeing have used it a little bit and tried to make their own versions of it. So that's a lot of fun to hear that. And then this has turned into a lot of other things. So I got a lot of students in the audience who are actually working on these. Um, Lottie Remmer-Nusa worked on this with me. Navin worked on it with me. Jason Choi, Preeti Govindaraju, and, and, and Shitadu Roy are working on this now to do different things to add on to this problem. And I think there's a lot of promise in this still. The other SOS motivated thing is this fleet evaluation tool. And I probably should have put the fleet efforts with Dan as co-PI at the top, because Dan and I really kind of cooked this up together. This has been, I, I like working with others. I think Dan keeps me sharp, and hopefully I keep him sharp and not annoyed too much. He's nodding. I'm not giving you a grade, so you can not, you don't have to nod. <laughs> too often, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the idea was to predict future, if I had a new aircraft or a new technology, how does that change environmental impact of aviation in the future? So in a nutshell, if I, Re-engine the 737, the 737 MAX is going to burn less fuel. But does that mean there's less carbon emissions from aviation? That really depends on how the airline uses it. So that's kind of the nugget here. And we try to look at this to investigate a bunch of different things. We're currently using it for one of the NASA, I mean, FAA projects. This is a stock and flow looking diagram. You don't have to follow the whole thing through. But the point I want to get across is the colors. We're taking aircraft factors and economic factors and market factors and environmental factors, all those different colors. At the center, we've got this allocation problem that's simulating a profit-seeking airline. Airline wants to make money moving people around. That's going to determine how they use airplanes. That's going to determine the environmental impact. So we've tried to copy what's called the carbon chart. Charlie Bolden showed this, but NASA, this is made up. This is what we'd like to have happen. We don't do anything, things keep going up. 
We keep improving technology, kind of just goes down a little bit, and that green wedge is if you add carbon, low carbon fuels and take credit for the you know, life cycle greenhouse gases, you'll eventually by 2050 be able to have half the carbon dioxide you had in 20, 2005 with continued growth in aviation. So this is a dream. And we started studying this, and you can see on the left there, that's how our demand is predicted to grow. The low carbon fuel scenario has a drop off in demand because the way we've implemented carbon fuels is they're really low carbon fuels are really expensive, right? $6 a gallon or $8 a gallon for the biofuel. And so that drove down demand through the feedback we had. And you can see what the carbon emissions do. So the carbon emissions don't go up as fast as the demand, but they start, don't go down to half of the 2005 level. They're about 150%. So this was neat simulations, and I think we're one of the couple places in the country that can do this kind of simulation. And there you see our results next to the carbon plot. So the good news is technology does help, and the low biofuels will help. But we need to think about this if we really want to meet those goals, or all those goals really what we want to try to meet. So again, a lot of help, a lot of students involved with that. And it's been fun working with Dan going back and forth to get this working. In the mix of this, let's see, this is, I told you I had a trouble saying no. I even tried to say Japanese no, and nobody listened. So. <laughs> I joined the AWA Aircraft Design TC as a young professional, and that got me a lot of connections. That's how I knew a lot of those review panelists that I started talking with. Then I became vice chair and chair elect in 2010, and I became the chair in 2012, 2014. Did a lot in conference planning. AIAA has gone through a lot of growing pains. It's not been fun or easy. I like to think I helped quite a bit move from the ATO conference to the Aviation Forum. We did something great, I think, locally. We, we really improved how we treat the Aircraft Design Award winner. I'm still involved with trying to improve the student design competition process. And so that's something that fell into while I was doing all these other things. And I thought that was worth pointing out because I really liked helping the AAA since those connections helped me out. So in 2011, uh, I had a chance to run into Steve Sawyer. So Steve is a Purdue alum, one of John Sullivan's PhD students. And I was at a different meeting, and, and Steve said to me, hey, are you going to meet Mark Sleppy when he's on campus? I said, oh, I, no, I, I don't know about it. So <clears throat> Mark apparently talked to Steve and figured out how to get Mark to talk to me. And, and there's an opportunity here by this Boeing-Purdue master agreement that Byron Pipes helped set up. And I managed to get to sit down and talk with Mark and found out what he was going to do. And he really wanted to do something where you would merge data from two different sources. I don't think I'm giving away too much here. And I realized, OK, the other person doing something like this is Dan. So here's another project where Dan DeLorenzis and I got to work together. We're both doing things that would touch this. As we started talking about what we wanted to have done, it became clear that Mark also wanted us to have a computational CFD component and an experimental component. So we got uh, Greg Blaisdell and Sally Bain involved, which was a lot of, it was neat to work with both of those people. I hadn't worked with either of them before. Sally being pretty new, Greg hadn't been here for a while, but I hadn't really interacted with them. And so this was a great project. And so we built our own wind tunnel model. I stayed away from the wind tunnel. I was, I, 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 we were joking about it, but I actually, I didn't get anywhere near the wind tunnel while that thing was in there. I've seen it since. <laughs> and then we did some stuff with the trap wing to do more complex geometry. And Greg's students did a lot of the CFD. And it was neat to, to kind of help oversee this and also be involved in some of the methods. Involved several people. Um, Jacob's in the audience. I think Michael I saw come in. Dan's been promoted since we gave this slide. Um, Aaron actually went off and worked at, at, at Boeing. And so did Monia. So that's worked out pretty well and got additional contacts at Boeing. So that was neat, and it was a good project. And I don't want to give the details about the research because I don't think we're allowed to. But you get the, the flavor, and I think that part I can talk about. So on December, sorry, September, I can't, can't read it there. September 23rd, 2014, we went up for the final dog and pony show. And so this is my first slide, and I gave the overview. And I think it went really well. And Byron Pipes' team did their composites project, also at the same outbrief. It went pretty well. We went to lunch. Well, you always see. This meeting, so I don't know how many Boeing familiar people there are in the audience. Building 4088, right, it's one of the Twin Towers. It's where the big visitor center is up in Everett. And you walk in, and to get to the meeting room, you have to go up this big elevator in the middle of everything, and another. It's important. OK, so we go to lunch. After lunch, Mark says, oh, I've arranged a VIP tour of the Everett factory. And I've been in the Everett factory before. But the VIP tour is where you get to wear little headphones and a guy walks you around the floor and you can actually touch stuff. It's really cool. And Mark managed to do that. And Tom was on the trip with us and uh, Byron and Dan and several, and some of our students working on the project. So that was really cool. I thought that was great. 
So we're walking down and walking past the different things and see the 7478. And I guess next was probably 67. And they moved a factory around, so maybe I got it wrong. And so we get to the eight, 787 line. And the 7879, this is not, I'll get there in a second. This is the first airplane. But we get down to the 787 line, and the nines are getting produced. And we're standing in group, and the tour guide's talking to us. And there's a huge, not huge, there's a commotion, and, and it looks like several people are running at us. And they were running at us. And it, it turned out it was a group of three Purdue alums who had taken 451 from me. And this is, I, I, I don't want to cry, but I might. <laughs> this has got to be one of the most validating moments of my career because these kids found out I was in 488, saw me. The word went out that I was there. These three guys that worked in the factory said, yeah. and we're standing in front of the third 7879 vehicle, and they come up, and, and Joe, I remember Joe was just like, hey, Joe, can, and Joe's like, Professor Crossley, can you get on our airplane? Because he's working on the 7879, test article three. I don't know. So I walk up to the tour guide and said, uh, you know, these are some of our students, and they, and they came and could we get on the airplane? He says, I've not been on the airplane. Let's go. <laughs> what a cool thing. I mean, I don't know. I've got goosebumps thinking about it. That, that was one of the more validating experiences for me, so I really enjoyed that. That was neat. <laughs> got to go inside the 7879 test aircraft three and, and look around, and, and, and Joe and Chris and the other Joe, they were just all excited to show us around. It was great. But I got spotted in 4088. That was the whole point about being on the elevators. You can't go up these elevators without being seen. Okay, so I think I mentioned like airplanes, right? So you probably heard about Pegasus. And it's got awarded in 2012. I kind of jumped the orders out here. We spelled Pegasus wrong on purpose. If you're really mad about it, it's Karen's fault. <laughs> but we had a, we had a, a great grant writer here at Purdue. When, when, when we do these big centers here at Purdue, come to find out, we get great support from, from different people. And we had a great grant writer for this. And she said, to make this consistent, you guys ought to come up with some themes you can talk about everywhere in the document. So it sounds like one person wrote it, even though 24 of you are going to write it. So our themes were safety was the obvious one, accessibility and sustainability. So there's the SAS part, right? And it's a partnership, and GA is GA, PGASO, it's almost there, and that's we got it. So Karin came up with the acronym. This award in September 2012, right? And I, you know, people said, are you interested in participating? I said, sure, I'm interested, right? I like airplanes. I know people at Cessna. I've worked with Cessna. We did some research with Cessna. I know people at Hawker Beechcraft. I know people at Gulfstream. This is great. I'll, I'm happy to do it. Start the proposal writing, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. We're, we're, what we're doing is we're competing against an incumbent and other teams, and our, our big spin is we've got great aviation at Purdue and at Ohio State and at Florida Tech, and we've got great engineering at Purdue and Texas A&M and Iowa State. And, wait, wait, wait a minute. Purdue is in both those lists. So I guess who gets to be director? It's me. <laughs> so we had a little bit of awkwardness, but eventually it came out that I had to be the, I needed to be the director, and I, I wanted to be the director. It's all kind of the same thing, right? So we put together this team. We have six core universities, uh, several affiliate universities to help us out with extra capacity. This has been going pretty well. Here's all of us. There's me as the site director. It's a great team. Karen's on the slide here. Mary's probably not here, but Mary out in aviation technology helps us. This is a neat way to work with the folks in at Polytechnic. A lot of great support. Allison has been great help to us here locally and my colleagues at other places. I guess I get to brag a little bit, and I don't want to go too far over time. That's right, Nate. Close. Um, so when the FAA put out the solicitation, they promised $500,000 a year from the FAA. So as of January, we've gotten $11.2 million. And 8.4 has come through our cooperative agreements, 2.8 through a, a contract. That means the 8.41 has to be matched. And I think I saw Melba sneak in the room all duck. I'm going to talk about matching. But uh, Purdue's been very helpful with that. And, and this is, I think this has been fun. We've got five new projects in development. Uh, I know Pat Watts talks about Pegasus as being one of the like, example centers. So that's really cool. I've got a lot of great people working with me on this. We're trying to do some new things. I wanted to mention this because uh, we want to get more a lot of the research the FAA needs is basic right away, I'm not basic, like applied right away research. And we'd like to do some more basic, far out looking research. And so we've figured out how to put students out there for the summer. And the hook is, with help from the folks at the FAA, the faculty advisors are working with the FAA mentors to talk about the project, to plant seeds for further work. We've run three research workshops. We've gotten some work out of the Flight Deck Human Factors one already. We're going to go down in May to Georgia Tech for the strategic research one. That should be a big plus for us. Time's already used up. It even says in my notes, it says, time is probably already used up. But it's awkward. I don't like to brag about myself, but I want to tell people how pleased I am for these things. I think I took the job. You, you, know, you saw the Neil Armstrong picture. I mean, the first guy on the moon wants to teach. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, I did a pretty good job. 
helping out with uh, this design project. They asked me essentially to teach the aircraft design class to undergrads at Arizona State. I kind of liked that. Things fell apart, I ended up here and I'm teaching. And, and I've really enjoyed this. And I got awarded the Gustafson Award a few times. What Gus is here, it's a great award to be named in Gus's honor. Uh, it kind of stopped about the same time I stopped teaching 251. I think because I had an unfair advantage when I was doing 251. The Bruin Award I've won several times in a row. It used to be Kathy, Steve, and I. And now actually there's a lot of people in that. Karen's in the mix, I saw Tyler in that. It's great that a lot of people here are doing well. Uh, I was lucky enough to be selected for the Potter Award in 2007. This is a picture of me getting inducted into Great Teachers. And so Steve nominated me, which I really appreciated. And, and Kathy's sitting here, and a couple of my colleagues are already in that. That was really neat. It was a lot of fun. And so I've got the big spear point in my office. So I wanted to mention that. I just, that's, that's been a lot of fun for me. And I, I think that's one of the things that I like to celebrate about the career. So real quick, I'm supposed to talk about future plans. And the document says seven years. Well, Pegasus is going to run for another seven years. And so I'm a little myopic because 50% of my time is Pegasus. They didn't tell me it was every other minute. That was the problem I didn't realize. <laughs> I spent a lot of effort on that, but I think we're doing, doing, we're doing the right thing there. So I'm gonna keep doing that. I wanna keep doing the best job I can teaching. I'm having a hard time keeping up, so I've got down to two classes a year, I'm trying to do a good job. The 451 kids will let me know how I did on the teaching evaluations here shortly. I think we need to keep this Purdue System Collaboratory moving forward. I really wanna have that happen. We're working that. We're gonna have some concentrations already available for distance students. And I'm really interested in how do I use my interest in optimization and aircraft to really look at how we impact the aviation environment, the environmental impact of aviation in the future. So I want to keep my research going as best I can in the sliver of time that's left for me to do that. John probably didn't know that I had this. I didn't know that I had this. I actually have a copy of the cover letter, or the offer letter you sent me. <clears throat> so I'll let you read that. That's what John wrote to me when he said, please come and take the job. And so I think Purdue's done their part, and I, I hope I've done mine and will continue to do mine uh, on this for the next couple of years. I mean, I hope I've, my talents and interests have, have done the right stuff and have been valuable and complimentary to everybody. So my, my 1995. I, there's no way I can list everybody that's been a big part of this. If I left you out today, I, I, I didn't do that on purpose. I, I want to list my graduate students. You know, the graduate students do a lot of the research work, and the research work is what's important to keep, keep moving forward and, and, and improve what you do. So I listed my graduate students here in a row. There's not, not any real order to them. It's just the order I could find them quickly. I have a lot of graduate students, undergrad students in my classes, my colleagues and collaborators here at Purdue, some great mentors inside and outside of Purdue. I really miss John McMasters. He was a great friend to me. Uh, and my family, uh, boy, I mean, <laughs> Kate was really upset that I'd spent a, a week in uh, Delft. Then when she found out I got to spend part of the day in Amsterdam because it saved me $1,200 in the airplane ticket, my seven-year-old was like, why didn't you come home? Or why didn't you take me with you? So she's going to go with me next time I go to Delft. She wants to go to Amsterdam. <laughs> but I appreciate that. It's been great. And so that's really all I had. Um, I think I went an hour and five. Kathy said nobody was after me, so it's my celebration. So I guess I get to do that, right? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, a lot. Thanks. Any questions? This is your chance. This is the same tie. <laughs> <laughs> is it braid at all? No, I'm not really, I don't wear ties that much anymore. I used to wear ties. So I, I, I think I have a colleague in the audience who, who picked this up for me. When I well, first got here, I had to wear a tie every day because if you've seen my official po picture, I didn't use that. My official picture looks like I'm 12. <laughs> and so if I showed up without a tie on, people thought I was part of the class. So I had a tie that either thought I had a job interview that day or I might have been the instructor. Well, it's an interesting <laughs> choice. Well, I don't know why. <laughs> I said, did you see what year it was when that picture was taken? 1992. <laughs> right? Now we'll all watch for that one. Yeah, I can't wear it ever again now. <laughs> I don't know if you have questions or not. I hope I, hope I gave you a picture of what yeah, it was being to me. Yeah, hi, Melba. Okay, good. I don't know, I'll answer that. <laughs> but th thank you for your help with that. I know we sometimes get, get cross purposes, but I do appreciate that.
involved in sort of this uh, across this interface? How did you, and how would you recommend that students who are interested in multiple kinds of things actually develop that trajectory for their career? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So I got on the trajectory because of the job that I had at McDonald. And because they were paying for my school, my, I kept looking for things to do at the university that would support my job, because that was really my original destination, where right, I was to stay at McDonald. So I had a little bit, you're right, I had a little traditional aerospace background, but my end destination was maybe a little different than somebody seeking a faculty job. So I started searching the catalog at ASU, looking for, oh, I need something. So I actually ended up in civil engineering and a structural optimization course, and then took optimization courses from the math department to get that kind of perspective. <coughs> And then I found there's a few colleagues and, and people senior to me doing this work. So Alon Crow at Stanford, who I, I like to count as a friend, Alon is one of the people leading this kind of area. And he was doing the work. And I started following what he was doing. So a lot of it was my own, I don't know if I'm answering the question well, but I, I got interested and I knew it was out there. I'm not sure how I knew it was out there. I guess it was my own interest to go find it. And then once I found that, I started finding people in aerospace doing that. And I think that that's what got me on the right trajectory to do this. But my I don't know if this answers the question well, but my PhD committee included two, three people from, from mechanical and aerospace engineering, which was the department. One person from industrial engineering who was a design methods person. Um, one person from civil engineering, and then I had somebody from McDonnell Douglas to provide that industry input that, yeah, this is relevant. So I kind of went and manufactured on my own. One of the other things I think that was useful is that uh, my advisor, Dave Lannanen, who does composite structures and was mostly crash worthiness guy, recognized that, hey, we're gonna let, I'm going to let Bill do what he needs to do. So that, that was a plus, too. I think mean, it just, a lot of things lined up, and I said, I want to go find these things, and I had to go find them. So what I recommend for students, boy, I, I think it's good even for my graduate students to get some work experience if they can, even if they know they want to go to a research or, or faculty trajectory, because there's this bigger window it sort of changes your context. What seems really important here in West Lafayette is not unimportant there, but there's other things that are mo more important there than we recognize here. <clears throat> and some of that was getting this bigger perspective. It's maybe a long answer, because I don't know if there's a clean answer. Hopefully that helps. Everybody has their personal experience. Yeah. So if you. I got three kids, and the gray hair is coming in. And <laughs> would, you, would you settle for a good-looking 48-year-old? Is that OK? <laughs> Hopefully. The other picture was 12. I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, a lot. Oh, Dan's got a question. So you're asking me these things. Wow. So my window in the FAA world is probably why it's going to be tough to see some of those things. Um, you know, the, I mean, this is not the answer that I should give, but I'll give it. You know, the FAA, it's, we, we help the FAA in general aviation, so not in this part of the thing. But they are so driven by making sure that it's, it's safe, 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 that they, by nature, have to be really rigid. I think the technology exists to have a quiet supersonic airplane. That's the big thing right now. The boom is why you can't do it. And so that's the thing in the policy. So FAA is safety. Let's make sure policy ensures safety. That one, let's make sure in, in supersonic. And let's make sure that policy ensures this quietness and not disruption of people's lives. So if, if this NASA X plane really does fly at the scale they're talking about, and we've got multiple examples now you can do this quieter, maybe that'll change. I think technology is there. I think it's going to be for the rich people. I, I, don't, I don't know how better to say that. The people who need the time more than the money. I don't think there's going to be a commercial supersonic transport anytime soon. That's Bill's opinion. It'd be cool, but uh, you know, Dave Eames' dad, Dave Eames was a, a colleague at Rolls-Royce. His dad flew the Concorde for British Airways. And his story was that British Airways flew the Concorde because it made money for them in advertising. It didn't make any money for them moving people back and forth. When do we get to other than tube and wing? You know, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure that the other things are so much more efficient 
that that outweighs all the other considerations of tube and wing. Passenger comfort, ease of loading and unloading, all those kinds of things, right? And, and you know some of those too, but I think that's my spin. I don't want to be negative about it. I think we should keep looking for ways to do that, right? But I think it's going to be hard unless we get some super magic breakthrough. You know, like if boundary layer ingestion really works and we can maintain laminar flow over a huge part of the airframe and we switch the structural concept, and I don't know how we do that, but we switch the structural concept so that that efficiency is so much better that it outweighs those other niceties of tube and wing, then we'll get there. But I don't know that's going to happen soon. That's part of your journey too, right? You can be at an aerospace engineering company, but in the end, you have to build a product. You have to build a product. Yeah, so at McDonnell, I was... X50 actually turned into something finally, but that was years after I was here, right? I mean, the stuff we did was all these fancy things in hopes that something in one of those fancy designs would actually help a product in the near future. And one probably people are familiar with the Sonic, it's not a great direct line, but the Sonic Cruiser product that Boeing did, did contribute significantly to 787. And that's kind of what we were doing. We were like on the crazy stuff, trying to pass along something that you have to make money for the company. And the kids in 451 know that. I said, you have to, Aerospace engineer's job is to make money for the company. Now, the good news is we get to do it by designing airplanes. So we get to do cool stuff to do it, but you still got to make money for the company. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so as a viewer of 451, I was just curious. Um, I'll get to the grading soon. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have your grade yet. <laughs> So, oh, so what gets me excited about coming back to you? Well, because it's what I did. I mean, that's, that's the base thing. I guess something about that job at McDonald really got me fired up. So what, what, so this, I know I sounded negative in answering Dr. D, but this idea about teaching 451 is what could we do next? How do we figure out what this airplane should look like or this helicopter should look like? How big does it need to be? How do I make that better? And I'm showing you guys the, the little pieces to get that path started, right? And I think that's the part that's fun to me. I like can always come back and we can talk about, hey, what's this airplane going to look like? You know, this year we've got this crazy NASA thing, 19-seat direct distributed electric propulsion airplane. Well, okay, that's kind of weird. Well, what does it take to make it work? That's kind of a cool question, right? And what would it look like? And how do we figure that out? So that keeps, keeps me coming back to, to 451. That's why I like teaching it. Yep. Oh, okay, Kartik, I didn't see you sneak in. That's right, you've been, eating, you've been eating the brownies, right? <laughs> So I'm not convinced that's necessarily an ME aerospace. I think it's maybe it's more of a systems, or even when I started showing my dissertation part, I said that, well, you missed that part. That's okay. I, I said, you know, quickly gave this simple idea of the process to come up with new rotorcraft. And the first one was the conceptual design. And it included this idea of what does the airplane look like and then how big it is. And to get those things put together, you have to think about the entire vehicle as a whole. And I think maybe that's what gets me thinking about an optimization problem is what's this higher level objective to pull the little pieces together so the little pieces are done so the higher level works. Even my airline problem has that in it. How do I get the right new airplane so that the airline works better? And so somebody who maybe is further downstream, and again, it doesn't have to be mechanical versus aerospace, but somebody who's further downstream, you're doing a structural optimization and you've got a fairly well-defined thing there and so your goals are a little bit different. I have this well-defined thing that I need to make better, not what is this thing I need to make in the first place? And I think that might be part of at least how I'm wired. I like to think about what does this thing should be like in the first place? And what does it affect? What does it touch? And that gets into why I'm involved in the systems collaboratory, right? How does my airplane actually do a better job providing transportation? <coughs> right? And how can I do that? So I don't know if that answers the question fully, but that's how I think about it. Is that how you think about it? You're not. He said, no. <laughs> you said your own model of that. I didn't know. <laughs> yes. 
As uh, a freshman student who's looking at the AAE, I'm, uh, of course, very overwhelmed by some of this, but also very uh, inspired by a lot of, you know, what's ahead sort of thing. So kind of in that uh, sense and the <clears throat> whole future-looking questions that were going around here, been very interested recently by the performance of things like Spaceship One, a lot of that, you know, suborbital space flight mm -hmm. uh, platform, and I'd kind of like a very professional opinion on if there is and what the possibilities might be in the future for those kinds of suborbital space plane platforms. I'm looking at all my colleagues who do that, <laughs> and I get a guess. Uh, I think, well, in, in the immediate need, there's a, there's a small enough group of people with enough money that want to do that, right? People pay money to climb Mount Everest and go up. I think it's that kind of category of people to do these suborbital space flights. Stephen Collicott's not here. Professor Collicott's interested in it. There's science that can be done suborbitally, suborbitally, that that doesn't need to go into orbit, and there's a huge magnitude of savings by doing that. If we don't get supersonic airplanes, and there is a viable way to do something that's exo-atmospheric but isn't necessarily orbital, maybe that becomes something as well, right? I think that's further out. But I think they're, they're proving the technologies out right now. I think the guys doing Spaceship One and Rutan's idea was to eventually provide access to space. It's not just the Virgin Galactic joyride for a few minutes. I think it's actually would be, can we get lower cost access to space? And there's always a need for that. I don't know if that's a great answer. There's probably people in the room who know more about it than me, but that's, that's how I view it. I think there's, and I think there's a neat thing, because when, when they're doing those kinds of problems, the lines between aeronautics and astronautics are really getting blurred. And, and yeah, I know more about airplanes, but I have done stuff with spacecraft, and I've helped Professor Howell and her committee. She's helped me with my students. And, and we need to be working across both those boundaries, right? Our school is aeronautics and astronautics, not aeronautics or astronautics. So. I think that's a good way. Okay. And it's hot in here, so please end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.